I'm weak. Apple and your smart marketing people, you got me. This is what I ordered. Let's unpack, let's see what's inside. So this is like the most expensive laptop I ever bought. I would actually never buy this personally, but since basically I've been running my complete YouTube channel of um, MacBook Air, as well as my other company, I thought it was time to invest in something a little bit more powerful. So this is the, let me just get rid of this box. This is the MacBook Pro 16 inch M1 Max. Now for software development, actually, I wouldn't recommend buying an M1 Max because it's way overkill, unless you're also doing lots of graphics processing. The main reason I got the M1 Max is because I need to do video editing. And the M1 Max has twice the number of video encoders and decoders than the M1 Pro. And I also got the 16 inch because for me to have the bigger screen is really useful. Let's unpack this baby, see what's inside. Well, I think we know what's inside, but I just want to check just to be sure. So what I'd like to do today with you is, because I've got this new laptop, also to show you what I do to set up a laptop for software development. Talk about how I set up my macOS operating system, the kind of settings I change, the apps that I generally use, and also talk a bit about how I set up VS Code and what kind of plugins you use. So this is a pretty Mac-focused video, though the VS Code part is probably useful for people on Windows as well. So if you don't use a Mac, use Windows, you're dismissed, but otherwise you might find this video interesting. So what's in the box is, well, of course the laptop, and we have a little cable here, and other than that, there is a booklet with, let's see, we have a getting started guide for if you don't know how a laptop works. Some guarantees and do we get stickers? We also get the stickers. I really don't care about the stickers, but apparently for some people this is really important. Let me just get rid of this. And we have this pretty chunky charger. So actually that's gonna be pretty nice. Uh, it's gonna make sure that uh, I can charge the laptop quickly though, mostly will be plugged in, I expect. So let's unwrap this bad boy and then I'm gonna show you how to set it up. Wow, that's impressive weight. Looks really, really nice. Let's open this up, shall we? And there we have the famous macOS startup screen. The version I got is the M1 Max Bint processor with 24 graphics cores because, well, it has the same number of CPU cores. That's important to me because I do a lot of software development. And it also has the same number of video encoders and decoders as the full-blown M1 Max computer. But I don't really do a lot of graphics stuff, so I don't need that many graphics cores. So I thought the 24 core was quite enough. I did get the pretty expensive two terabyte upgrade because I work with video, so those files are really large, but if you don't work with video or need huge storage for 3D rendering or things like that, you don't need that much storage and probably one terabyte is enough. I would upgrade to the one terabyte though and not just buy the base 512 gigabyte storage but because that's just really not enough in my opinion. I also didn't upgrade the RAM, so it's- To use English as the main language, press the return key. Okay, I have to listen to my Apple overlords. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, so I only got the 32 gigabytes because frankly, that's enough for me. And it seems that given how fast the SSDs are in these machines. Mac OS contains a built-in screen reader called VoiceOver. If you I... know how to use VoiceOver, press Command F5 now to turn it on and set up your Mac. If you would like to learn how to use VoiceOver to set up your Mac, how press the escape key. How do you, how do you shut this thing up? I... Okay, anyway, 32 gigs, because I think that's enough, because the SSD speed is fast enough so that the swapping is not really an issue. So before this thing starts talking again, let's start installing some stuff on it. So basically what I have here is now a bone stock, empty MacBook Pro. So first I wanna go through some of the general settings that I change on my MacBook in order to make it behave the way that I want to. Then I'm going to cover a couple of apps that I generally install that I find quite useful. Uh, these are mostly Mac specific. And 
then I'm going to talk about VS Code and the plugins I use in VS Code. So if you're a Windows user, you might want to skip ahead and go straight to the chapter that covers VS Code. Anyway, let's dive in. So I have here now my Finder open because I want to start with a few things that I do to modify the way that the Finder looks. And the first thing that I always do is I go to View and then I want to show the status bar, which is the bar here at the bottom, so I know how much space I have available and how many items I've selected. And I also want to show the path bar, which is the bar that's here so I can see where I am in the folder structure. I generally also add a couple of things to favorites, uh, like if I install Dropbox, I want my Dropbox to be here and a couple of other things, but that's a detail I won't cover it in this video. Another thing that I like to do is customize the icons that you see here at the top. And you can click right and then you do customize the toolbar. And now you can select the items that you want to see in the toolbar. So a couple of them are already in there like back, forward and view. But they also particularly like to add the new folder icon that I find very useful. So I just add it right there so I can more quickly add a new folder. And for the rest, I don't change anything here. So now I want to show you a couple of the settings that I generally change on my Mac. So the first thing that I do is click on general and then I make sure that I've selected the dark theme because of course I have a dark soul and also bugs are attracted to light. So I prefer my theme to be dark. So the other things that are in here, I don't really change them. Then what I change is I go into the dock and menu bar settings and there I want the dock to be a bit smaller. And I also want to make sure that I automatically hide and show the dock so that I have a little bit more screen space. What I also do is customize the menu bar a bit. There is here, for example, a spotlight icon which opens spotlight search. Well, I normally use command space for this, so I find that way easier. So what I do is I go into my dock and menu bar settings and here is spotlight and then I disable the show in menu bar options so that the menu bar in the top right is a bit cleaner. Next, I want to change a few things about how the keyboard and the trackpad work. So let's start with the keyboard. There are two options that are important. There's key repeat. So if you hold a key longer than how fast is the key going to repeat and the other one is how long does it take until the key starts repeating and I generally put the delay here pretty short like so so that when I type and hold the key it starts repeating relatively quickly I find that helps me when I write code in uh, in my code editor what I also do is change the modifier keys so these are the basic the default mapping so everything is mapped to itself but I never use caps lock and I do find escape really useful, especially if you're using an editor like Vim. So I changed the caps lock to be an escape, like so. So those are my basic keyboard settings. And then let's go to the trackpad where I also change a few things. Like, for example, I like tap to click because I like to be able to tap with one finger and that basically registers as click. I also switch off force click and haptic feedback. I find it generally doesn't really do that much for me. And sometimes it happens that I press too hard and then I accidentally have a force click and I really don't want that. So I prefer this to be off. Then in scroll and zoom, I also make sure that all of these things are on because I find them quite useful. And there are more gestures here, which are also mostly on. So I leave this as is. There's a few apps that I like to install. One is called Flycut. Flycut is a clipboard manager that's totally free and it helps you with copying and pasting multiple items. So I'm going to install this. So just to quickly show you how this works, I have a simple text editor here. I can write some text like so. And then when I select a word and I do copy and then I do shift command V, which is paste, then I can select whatever I copied before. And this is actually what Flycut does. So this allows you to keep track of the previous things you copied or pasted. And I think that's really helpful. So that's Flycut. There are also two other apps that I use for security. There is Bitwarden, which is my main password manager. So I'm going to install that one as well. And the other one that I like to use is Authy, which is a tool for two-factor authentication. It's an alternative to the Google Authenticator. And actually the nice thing about Authy is that it syncs across your device. You can have Authy installed on your phone, on your iPad, on your Mac, and then it syncs two-factor authentication codes across your devices, which is really useful. A tool that's very important to me because I deploy applications to the cloud is Docker. So I go to the Docker website and then I install Docker for desktop. And I make sure, of course, because this is an Apple chip, to download the version for the Mac chips. So now that Docker is downloaded, I'm going to run the installer. 
So now Docker is up and running and I can sign in and start using it. The next thing that I do is install Homebrew, which is a very useful package manager for macOS. So this is going to allow me to install lots of other packages that are really useful. So we need to copy this command that we have here and then let's start the terminal. And now I'm going to install Homebrew. Once you've installed Homebrew, there's a couple of things you need to do to finish it up, like copying these things so that Homebrew is added to your path. So I'll also run this command. And now let's see if this works. Let's list the installed packages. So there's basically nothing. And now we can start installing packages using Brew. Now I prefer the iTerm2 terminal over the built-in macOS terminal. So the first thing I'm going to do is install this improved terminal. So I've installed iTerm now, so let's close the Mac terminal and then let's start iTerm2. Now the nice thing about iTerm2 is that you have a lot more options than the regular terminal. Like for example, you could define keyboard shortcuts, you can have various arrangements, you can modify how the pointer works. There's options for changing the appearance of the terminal, so that's all really nice. But there's one thing in particular that I like to do in combination with iTerm is that I also install Oh My Z Shell. And Oh My Z Shell is a framework for managing your Z Shell configuration. It has lots and lots of plugins, so you can customize the way it works. I particularly like that you can indicate the uh, name of the branch in the Git repository if you're in the folder where which is handled by Git. And there's lots and lots of other things you can change. So in order to install this, you need to copy this command and then run it in the terminal. And as you can see, immediately the appearance of your terminal changes, which is really cool. And from time to time, whenever there's an update, this is gonna ask you to update itself whenever you start the terminal. So now that we have Brew installed, iTerm, and Oh My Z Shell, I'm going to install a couple of other apps using Homebrew. And the first one that I'd like to install is Rectangle, which is a free window manager for macOS. So now that Rectangle is installed, let's start it up. What you see is that Rectangle adds an item to the menu bar right here, and it provides a number of shortcuts to move your windows, for example, to the left half or the right half, or maximize the window. I use this app all the time because it allows me to keep my hands on the keyboard and control where my windows are. So that's just incredibly useful. I think this should actually be built into macOS, but it isn't, so well, we have to deal with it like this. So that's rectangle. Most of these things are not directly aimed at helping software developers, but they're still quite useful. So now let's add a few apps that we're going to need as Python developers. Now in the past, when you got a fresh new Mac machine, it came installed with Python 2.7 point something, basically a corpse. But it seems now if I type Python, that actually is no longer there, which is interesting. But if I check for Python 3, then there is actually a version of Python 3 that's now installed. So I'm not entirely sure, but I almost can't believe it. Has macOS updated the Python version from Python 2 to Python 3? That would be amazing. Anyway, what we'd preferably like to have is a bit more flexibility in terms of the versions of Python that we're dealing with. And in particular, I'd like to have a more recent version than 3.8.9. But what I like to install is PyEnv to manage the different versions of Python for me. So let's start by installing PyEnv first. If you have macOS with Z Shell, you also need to make sure that once you installed PyEnv, that you add these things to your Z profile and your ZSHRC file, so that whenever you start the terminal, PyEnv actually properly initializes the correct Python version for you. Once we've done that, we can start installing the versions of Python that we need. So I'm just going to install the latest one at the time of recording of this video. And now let's change the current version of Python to be 3.10.1. There we go. And as you can see, PyEnv also selects the right version of pip for us that's associated with version 3.10.1. Another thing you want to install, which is of course also really useful, is Git. And that also looks to be pretty good. So those are the basic things that you're going to need. 
Except, of course, one thing, you need a code editor. I'm using VS Code. There's other options out there like PyCharm, depending on what you need. But I'm just going to install VS Code here and then I'll also show you a couple of the plugins that I like to use in my VS Code setup. So I'm going to download the Mac Universal build. So I've now downloaded VS Code and I can move that to my Applications folder like so. And then let's open it up to see that it's to check that it works correctly and that all looks great. It's dark theme, which of course I like. So let's fit it to the screen like this. Now there's a couple of settings that I like to change in VS Code. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. So it's going to sync the settings from my other computer. So these are some of my user settings. Some of them are related to GitHub Copilot, like which types of files I want to use Copilot on. But there's a couple of them that are interesting, like uh, these ones. I like to add these settings here so that, let me make this a bit bigger, so that whenever I edit Python code and I save it, then I want to have automatic formatting on. So I'm using black for this. That's my formatting provider of choice, which I like. It's very opinionated. It doesn't have too much options, but just make sure that it looks nice and clean. And then I make sure that whenever I save a file, that black automatically formats it for me. That's what these settings do. And I also have organized imports so that I'm always certain that the imports are neatly organized and I don't have to worry about that. Another thing that I do is this, and that's related to the Vim plugin. So maybe I should just quickly talk about the plugins that I have installed. If you're developing in Python, then the most important one you should have is the Python language extension. And, and that actually installs lots of other things as well, like PyLands and Jupyter Notebooks. In principle, this mainly adds all the language features and auto-completion, etc., etc., for Python. So that's actually pretty useful. There's a couple of other plugins that I install as well. One is Docker, so that I have Docker integration in my VS Code. So that can be quite useful sometimes. I've GitHub Copilot. I've been playing around with this. I'm not yet entirely sure whether I want to keep using it or not, but sometimes it's pretty useful. There's this theme I was playing around with, but I think I'm going to remove that again because I don't really need it. Then I have this one. I talked about Mermaid in a recent video, which is a really helpful tool to create diagrams of all different kinds, like UML diagrams, uh, flowcharts, etc. I did a video about uh, Mermaid a while ago. I'll put a link to that video in the top. So this plugin is really helpful there because it allows me to add Mermaid diagrams to markdown files, which is really useful. That's prettier, which is also a code formatter, but I mainly use that for my TypeScript and JavaScript development, so I won't talk about it too much now. There is this, which is a Microsoft installed plugin. I haven't really used this, so I'm not really sure what this is. This seems to be related to Docker. But the main thing that I want to mention is the Vim plugin that I use. That's this one. And this allows me to have a Vim editor-like capabilities in VS Code. I'm still a Vim noob, even after like half a year of using it. But I find it quite useful. And as I'm learning more and more about how Vim works, I notice my editing skills also starts to improve. So that's pretty nice. But in the settings, I change one particular thing, which is this Vim Smart Relative Line. And what that does is you see that on the left here, it changes the way that line numbers work. Normally, if I change this to false, like so, then as you see, we get the regular behavior of line numbers like what you're used to. But if I change this to true, like so, now you see we get a different behavior. And what happens is that you always see the, the line number of the line that you're currently on. So this is line 23. But then you have relative line numbers going up and going down. And that's actually pretty useful for Vim because often you're referring to other lines relatively while you're editing code. So smart relative line, I uh, set that to true. Oh, finally, there's also VS Code PDF that I use, which allows me to display a PDF in VS Code, which is pretty useful. And that's actually it for the most part. I've been playing around also with this plugin, it's called Error Lens, and it adds better highlighting of errors and warnings. I'm a bit on the fence of whether I really like to use this because it does add a lot of extra information to your screen and I like my code editor to be relatively clean. So um, I'm not really sure about this one, but let me know what you think about it. But those are the plugins that I use for my VS Code setup and I keep things 
relatively simple. I don't uh, modify lots and lots of stuff in, in VS Code. Now, of course, next to these applications, I, th I think if you have this installed on your Mac, you're pretty much ready to go. Um, there's lots of other apps that I use, um, more productivity apps like uh, Notion, which I really like, or uh, I use Dropbox for cloud storage. I have Chrome, which is useful, especially if you're doing web development, you want to test it on different browsers. I use VLC Media Player sometimes. I have OBS for live streaming. I have MongoDB Compass because for my company, we're using MongoDB and having a tool that allows me to view the contents of the database is pretty useful. And then, of course, uh, other tools like Acrobat Reader for PDF. That's pretty useful. I use Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer for creating thumbnails and other assets that I need for my YouTube channel. And of course, the Discord server, which I use to get access to my community on Discord. If you haven't joined yet, here's the link to join if you'd like to. You're most welcome there. It's a pretty nice community. So that's it in terms of apps that I install and settings that I change in macOS. So I keep things pretty simple, pretty basic. I don't change too many things. So if you have a Mac, I hope this gave you a couple of ideas of how you can set it up so that it works well for you as a software developer. If you enjoyed this video, give the like. And if you want to learn more about software design and software development, consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you soon.